are really the bodies which are speaking up, which are either contesting, challenging, providing alternatives, and that is very crucial. So I'll start with, we have heard the preamble in the morning, and uh, our textbooks always used to have the preamble. Also the question is, what is it that we understand by the preamble? And in the last few years, it was so heartening to see students, especially university students, standing with the Constitution. Literally, on the streets, I mean, all over the country we were having, before the COVID, you all must have seen how there were protests and students just standing and reading the preamble. Why was that happening? And it is important to understand that things were happening in the country. We all know that there were laws being passed about citizenship, and that was one reason that students were standing with the preamble. But there were things happening which the students were challenging, and that agency which students have to question, to remind us, to remind us that this is what the Constitution said, and are we today following that? And to remind us that education has a major role. It is not just reading about it in social and political science, one subject, which was earlier called civics. Luckily, we changed the name. I think Karnataka is still calling it civics in the social science textbooks. Why did we change the name? It is not that we read only about the constitution there, but our constitution and our makers of the constitution, the people who thought what kind of a country is going to be formed after the colonial struggle, for them, education was very important. Uh, I can't repeat it enough that Ambedkar and Gandhi, when they were saying that voting is one thing, we have a vote. Our country had a vote much before many European countries had it universal voting for women. Switzerland, women didn't have a vote till 1970. So there is something radical about the way our country was thought of. They said whether you are poor or rich, whether you are man, woman, whether you have land or not, everyone will have a vote. And Ambedkar said, because before that, voting was only if you had some property or land, only then you could vote, or if you had education. So Ambedkar said, already for centuries we have deprived people from education, now we cannot deprive them of a vote because they did not get education. This is double depriving a person. So we must, and our students were reminding us that our country has had a radical constitution which said that education will be the place, education will be the platform where democracy is understood, where democracy is lived, where we try and understand each other. Like in the morning session, we experience each other. We experience the differences that we come with, we experience the inequalities that we come with. We experience it in a class. We experience that your food and my food can be different, but they are food. I cannot say that because you eat something, I will come and kill you. Or because my oil is not smelling very nice to you, you can throw me out. So where do we learn this? So we unlearn. When we come into this platform of education, we unlearn many things, all of us. We, and we, that is important for everyone to come together on this platform. And all our policies said that we have brought democracy, but we have to nurture it in education, nurture it in the classrooms, nurture it through our textbooks. Are we doing that is the question. Are we doing that in Karnataka? Are we doing that in Udupi? Are we doing that in all our villages? Is the classroom really something which is nurturing an understanding of difference, an understanding of inequality, and then dreaming and envisioning and asking for a change where we can think of equity and justice? So 
uh, we were reading in the task force, we were reading the Curric Karnataka Curriculum Framework 2007. I don't know if all of you have been reading it or ha are familiar with it because it happens that documents stay on in these bodies, they don't necessarily come to us as teachers or come to as, us as people in the classrooms. So the Karnataka Curriculum Framework which came after NCF 2005, the National Curriculum Framework, which was a major change in looking at what curriculum should be. And it said that the curriculum must understand issues of difference. It must really understand that children's knowledges are very different when they come in a classroom. As a teacher, do I understand what the child knows? Even in Delhi SCRT, when we said that children any age can come into a classroom, the right to education said any age the child can come to a classroom. When we were asking what do we know about children, they said we'll take a test. Take a test, take a written and write, uh, uh, reading and writing test, why? Suppose I don't know how to read and write, is it that I don't know anything? Is that what the school system assumes? I don't know anything because I really don't read and write. So this whole question about what is children, what do children know, what is their knowledge, and now what can education do? So the KCF, of course, said very clearly that, uh, you know, that it is now clear across the country that joyful and child-centered learning, these are two words, two mantras which have been used, can be very superficial. We can say something is joyful, we can say some activities, but it is not necessary that all children are participating and their knowledge really finds place, their experience finds place. So KCF begins with that and it says that if we look at the numbers and they give us numbers from 2002, uh, the data from Karnataka and they say if 100 children enter class 1, if 100 children, then uh, children who reach class 8 are only 43 and children who reach, who enter uh, class 11 are only 16 out of 100 and children who pass class 12 are 12. This is what they're saying in the Karnataka curriculum framework. And they're saying that, so we have to see what is happening, why is this dropout rate so high? And what they say is that, uh, so what we are saying now in 2024 is that yes, this is important and uh, now in 2009, 2010, every child has a right to education. So there should be some difference in the way we look at a child and look at education. What is that difference? And also we are saying that, uh, you know, the, the report says that, that uh, this is a, actually there is a lot of wastage and stagnation in the system because so many people are passing. So we ask the question that wastage Who's wasted? And these are words which are very old because they think that the system is having a lot of wastage. They're not even looking at the child. The system is having a lot of wastage. You know, we brought 100 children. They all dropped out. Only 12 got left. So much wastage. So we are saying that we have to ask that what is, what does pass mean? What does it mean to pass? To pass what? Who is making this exam? Whose knowledge is being looked at in this exam? What are we asking? When you look at the exams, are you satisfied by what you are asking or what the exam is asking children? Is this useful? And also, who passes? Who are those who pass? And who are those who fail? Are we looking at that also? Why I'm saying that is because our new policy NEP 2020. It does not look at any words like caste, religion, gender, nothing. These words don't matter for that policy. And it puts everyone which, who might have some disadvantage into socially 
uh, educationally disadvantaged groups. SEDGs, they call them. That you know, these are some <coughs> groups. So, if we refuse to look at even what are the reasons that we are coming from unequal backgrounds, and we had a chairperson of this committee of the NCF of NEP 220 and NCF 2023, we had this chairperson, Professor Kasturi Rangan, when the policy came out and TV, everyone asked him the same day, how is it? The policy does not talk about caste. He said, where is caste? I don't see any caste. So if a chairperson of our policies does not see caste, what are we doing? Who are we invisibilizing? So there are a lot of things, a lot of people, a lot of knowledges, a lot of disadvantages that are being invisibilized regularly and now even much more. And I'll come to that. I'll talk about the, the cultural politics around this invisibilizing. What do we do? What do we focus on? And what do we not focus on? And why is it that our, the last budget allocation talks only of exemplar schools? So major funding of the central budget will go to exemplar schools. It is now called Institute of Excellence. It was always a diet, but you brand it now, Institute of Excellence. Every Kendri Vidale was a very well-resourced Kendri Vidale. One of our best government schools, the funds they're getting, the teachers they're getting, the resources they're getting, Navodhi Vidale. Now they are branded separately. They're called PM Shri. It's a long acronym. Some, you know, what's, what is so special? But they are getting much more money now. So they will get about 98 lakhs uh, of funding from the center every year, much more than any school. Why? Why is this branding which says that there is something called excellence and the others are just, they can go to some very foundational literacy, numeracy, they can do some uh, diluted curriculum and they should go for skill courses, vocational education. So the school system is creating its own caste system, its own hierarchy, its own very clearly defined uh, borders, hierarchies, who can deserve what and that is understood and the central government, the government will focus only on that. So schools are being closed, they are being merged, you know how many thousand schools are being closed in every state because they are not viable very low attendance, this is a remote school, this is a forest area, this is a tribal area, very remote area, not many children coming, not efficient for the government to spend money on a school. The child has a right to education. So the constitution is being violated by all these new policies, but no one is making a noise. And when the states are withstanding, like if the Tamil Nadu is saying this is not, we are not approving of this. If Kerala is saying this is going to go against our children, we have already got many children into schools. Now to say we are closing schools for the Adivasi area or the tribal areas is not okay. Tamil Nadu is saying it is cruel. The Tamil Nadu said in a court, this policy is cruel because it is going to be pushing children out of the school into vocational and what we are trying to bring everyone, it's going to do undo that. So it's cruel for us. Uh, and But uh, the government is twisting the arms of these states and saying, they're not sending money for Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan. Simple. Last two installments, no money sent for teacher salaries, Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan, unless you sign the MOU for some special schools called PM Shri schools. Few schools, we will give money, but you have to sign the MOU that they will come under CBSC. They will not be under the state board. So this way of privileging some schools, centralizing them, saying they will be under CBSC, they will be special, we'll give a lot of money for that. And in the last five years, the government, state, central government has reduced funding to Sarva Shiksha Abhyan and delay. So what is happening? What is a new notion of this special excellence that is being created, which invisibilizes 
all the other differences or disadvantage that we come from, that we come with, and why is this being done? So, of course, the question is that um, the I, we just remind ourselves that the right to education had said that a state academic authority must lay down the curriculum and evaluation procedure. Karnataka doesn't have this. There is no academic authority. Karnataka only has a government department. And that is surprising. Everything that is made in terms of syllabus and curriculum is made by a committee which exists only till the time they are writing the textbooks. After that, there is no committee. So when we went to the DSCRT, they are only a government department. They only have departmental posts. There is not an academic post in that body. When we went to the textbook society, they say, we don't write any textbooks. We only assist the committee which the government makes. This is shocking. How for so many decades has the government not even adhered to the right to education, not adhered to what a constitution is saying, and continues everything through the government and a state, and all these discussions about whether something was included, not, these, you know, we have lots of debates in Karnataka, what is included, what is not, all this, no one is answerable. And it is not just a question of including something or excluding something in terms of one writer, one ideology, one thinking, one religion. It is not just that. It is much more. When we see the textbooks, people writing are only from higher education and they don't understand children. So the way they write, even we find difficult to read. How can a child understand? And that is the big question. What are teachers' collectives doing? Are they really bringing up their voice in terms of this is not something that a child can understand, whatever the, wherever the child is coming from? Private school, public school, rich, poor, this cannot be understood. This is not a concept how is, it is developed. Where do we make this? Where do we make this noise from our experience? our experience of teaching, our experience of what it means to be learning, and our experience of engaging with children, different children, for so many years. And that is a big question. So, uh, uh, and 